So everybody that is here at the moment, thank you for coming along. Um, it's been a, yeah, unfortunately we, we couldn't get the one last month together, had a, a guest fall through, but managed to secure the team from Big Mate here today uh, to talk about some of the work that they've been working on. Uh, Big Mate's actually a, a local business here in Brisbane, not a newcomer in the grand scheme of many AI startups that have been popping up recently. So yeah, got quite a, an interesting story been around here for a while and not just with the product, but, you know, also, um, you know, even working within the cloud and, and working quite closely with AWS and some of the infrastructure side of things. So quite interesting. Um, to, to, to do the talk tonight, we've got uh, Brett Orr. Um, Brett is, is essentially the, the business side of the business. Um, Brett, either general manager, CEO? I am. I am. Perfect. Whichever time yeah. you would like, Michael. Your exact title, yeah, the, the whip cracker. Um, yeah, Brett has uh, yeah, over 34 years of leadership experience, lots of lots of time are in IT, IoT, AI, telematics. Um, and, and Brett obviously focuses on the business side of things over at Big Mate. Um, we originally were planning on having Gregory here, but uh, we've actually got Peter, who is Gregory's boss, who is the CTO of Big Mate, come along and, and give the talk. Uh, Peter is essentially heading up the technical side of the business, um, and yeah, we'll be we'll be going through a lot of the technical stuff that we have here tonight. Uh, his main superpower, other than wearing his underwear on the outside of his pants, is all about video and video analytics. So we'll yeah be quite interested to hear from him and, and some of the things that he has to talk about. So without further ado, I will hand it over. Um, just a note to all the guests: if you do have any questions along the way. Uh, please put them in the chat. We will reserve some time towards the end of the talk to go over them. So definitely drop them down there and I will take note and ask away towards the end. Take it away, guys. Thanks, Michael. Really appreciate that. Um, not knowing uh, Peter that well, I'm wondering how you did know that he wore his underwear on the outside, but that's something we won't go into. Uh, so look, we're, we're really pleased to be here. And as a, as a business yeah, our head office is in Queensland, but Pete heads up uh, our technical one of our technical branches in um, in Victoria, and obviously you can see him at home. And if you see his picture, you haven't seen his picture, but his hair is a lot shorter. He hasn't been able to go out being a Victorian for many many months. He's been on on lockdown. There you go. That's that's what Pete normally looks like. So Pete and I run the business. Yes, I might have the the mantra as um, the CEO or the or the GM, but um, from a technical point of view, that's where Pete fits. So I'm going to bore you a little bit to give you a little bit of information about um, Big Mate and who we are, and then let's get into the juicy side of things. What also we're going to do is, if you've got, um, if, if we're, we're going to try and keep this conversationalist and provoke, so at the end of the day, if you want to have conversation, if you want to push anything through, let us know. What Michael said is true. We're a 30-year-old um, startup, so we've been around for a long time. Um, but if you look at where we push and what we're doing in the IoT side and the computer vision, it's, it's fairly important. One of the other things that's absolutely crucial to creating a strong business in my belief, and what you're going to get today, by the way, guys, is my belief and Peter's belief. You'll get some industry insights. You'll get some thoughts about what's happening out there. It's the way that we see the market, not only um, ASEAN-based or APAC-based, but also globally. Um, we have offices in Australia, in, in Brisbane, head office and, and Victoria. We have offices in Singapore, KL um, and in the States. So there's, there's quite an uh, interesting dynamic uh, of where we deal and, and what we do. Um, and to get Pete and I together in the same room, I was saying to Michael before is, well, in the same virtual room is something that's uh, rather unique. We speak a lot um, running the business together, but it's, uh, we, we tend to run separately doing our own little tasks. So partners are strong. We are a, um, an Axis development partner. So for those of you who don't know Axis, um, that's the end point on our computer vision side. That's the cameras and are one of the world leading camera distributors and, and responsible for the introduction of IP cameras globally. Uh, and and a, a very good partner so far as where development's going, what's happening, what's happening at the edge and, and where things are going. Pete will get into what we're doing at the edge and Axis develops that a little bit later. The other partner for us that's incredibly important uh, has facilitated a lot of our growth, a lot of the functionality we have, and it's, it's really nifty to do cool things, 
but it's even niftier to do cool things for many, many people. So that ability to scale is, is incredibly important. And the other partner that I mentioned is a company called Amazon Web Services, AWS. You may have heard of them. Um, and, and they are absolutely key to our growth. We are one of their global partners. We just won their technology partner of the year for 2020, which we're pretty proud of. But we use a lot of their services in the back end to deliver what we do. Now, I don't want to take away from what Pete and his team do. There's a whole lot of development that we do in the back end, but we don't reinvent the wheel. What we do is we create the wheel. So a lot of what you hear about is going to be about what Big Mate as an organization has created here in Australia and then pushed globally um, based off the functionality, the flexibility and the expansion of what AWS offer, which is pretty darn cool. As an organization, we're a computer vision organization an Internet of Things organization and a, uh, a AI and ML partner for a lot of organizations, uh, whether that's as a them as a client to us or whether that's someone like Axis or AWS. What I want to do right up front is I want to define what Pete and I define as IoT because it's really, really important. There's a whole lot of mixed messaging around that. And I'm not saying that we're right. I'm not saying that we're wrong. I'm just telling you this is the way that we look at it. So IoT is a sensor sitting out somewhere on the edge that has a transit layer that takes information back to storage that goes into analytics and presents a meaningful business outcome. So by that definition, it doesn't need to be a thin client. It doesn't need to be low bandwidth. It doesn't need to be something that's transmitting eight bytes per minute. It can be something that's very, very rich in its content like video because a video is just a richer source. So again, that definition of where we come from is, is really important. Um, so Pete, I might get you just to introduce yourself and where you come from before I move on. Sure. Um, thanks, Brett. So um, I'm the CTO, I'm a technologist at heart. Um, I come out of the uh, broadcast video uh, and public sector space, um, predominantly around technology. Um, do uh, you know my heritage is in emergency services and and building technology that brings data in from the field in in really challenging environments like bushfires. So um, I've kind of had to do the hard yards in those really complex, challenging bureaucratic environments, and then brought those those learnings into the commercial sector, which is um, really around computer vision applications, IoT, and and architecting high end uh, systems, enterprise systems in the cloud. Thanks, Pete. So, guys, I'll, I'll give you what our core products are. We're going to focus today very much on the video side of it. So, we, I, I'm going to talk um, for a couple of seconds on what the use cases are. So, why people want to do this. Again, it's really, really important to understand doing cool stuff and doing stuff that's really, really technically advanced, as we do as an organisation, and puts a smile on my face every single day and, 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 and makes Pete also very interested and smile every single day. That's cool but delivering a meaningful business outcome. So delivering something that businesses want to affect someone's life, that's cooler. And, and that's what we're going to talk about. So what we do in the, v, in the um, computer vision side of things, the CV side of things, is we focus, uh, we have a big focus on safety. So that's protecting people's lives, making sure that everyone has the greatest chance of going home safely after a day at work. And, and, and honestly, every person... Um, you, you put your heart and your soul into work, but you deserve to go home safely. And there's a lot of threats that come in there. Now, whether that's um, with the dynamic geofencing, I'll talk about that a little bit later, change state monitoring, collision avoidance, thermal imaging, which is really, really topical. And I'll talk about that first today around COVID-19 and some of the stuff that we've been doing around that and some of the, the devil that's in the detail that Pete will go through a little bit later. Um, it, it, it's, it's really about making sure that you go to work, you come home safe. Um, IoT, we're not going to talk too much about that. I told you what the definition of IoT is, but we do a lot of work with um, local government and government, depending on which country you're in, but local government here in Australia, around monitoring their assets. So whether that means that a barbecue is being used correctly, whether that means a garbage bin needs to be emptied at a certain point in time or doesn't need to be emptied at a certain point in time, whether their water flow is happening, they have enough water in their tanks to, to effectively service their constituency. Um, we do a lot of that and it's basically lighting up their environment with um, IoT. So little sensors that give big information and, and impactful 
um, insight as to what's happening. And then, you know, uh, Pete talked about um, some of his problem solving capabilities and, and Pete is good and his team are good. What we do is we take difficult problems and we make them an easy business solution. It doesn't mean the, the problem is easy to solve, but we make it interesting. And from our point of view, it comes back to that. It's cool to be cool, but it's cool to be cool if people think you are. So we make sure that we can do it and it's scalable and it, and it pushes forward. Um, thanks, Pete. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a product called Thermi. Now, Thermi is a product that was born from the loins of a product that you'll hear about a little bit later called Warney. I wear it proudly on my sleeve. Um, it's a product around safety and safety management, and it's all around AI and ML, and you'll hear a little bit about that later. But Thermi was spawned from that. And Thermi's been around for two, two and a half years now. Um, it would be somewhere in between those. And it was originally designed as a product that fixed to either helicopters or fixed wing planes to look at disaster monitoring. So when fires were outbreaking, to understand where the fire front was, to understand where the spot fires are coming from, to integrate with the Bureau of Meteorology, to understand where the wind shears are coming from, where the likelihood of expansion of fires and destruction of property to, um, and, and harm to people or threat to people could happen. And then and that's an interesting environment to work in and it's really, really cool. That's one of those cool things. And it's also for us, it's great because budget is irrelevant. Outcome is very, very important. But that moved into something that's more realistic and, and you know, we still deal in that. We've been doing that for many years, but moved into something that's more realistic where people had a, a, a unique business problem. And that unique business problem was we're getting spontaneous combustion in large thermal masses. So large amounts of recyclables or, or rubbish or or um, produce were heating up to a stage where they would spontaneously combust. And how do we stop that happening? We have one client that has a number of global um, shops and or stores or outlets or factories. And um, what happened was on average, one of their factories where they're producing or removing these recyclables was um, spontaneously combusting once a month. Now, what that actually meant is best case scenario, they lost some of their recyclables worst case scenario they've lost some of their assets so they asked us is there a way that you can use your thermal technology to detect um, triggers to something lighting up we did that the next thing they looked at and this is where i'm getting to more relevant was um, around skin detection they said what we're having and this is long 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 before covid sort of got the number one spot on the um on the most hated uh, viruses globally um, there was this thing called a flu and where you've got lots of people coming into work and they're in close contact, if someone comes from an area where maybe they're not earning a lot of money, they can't afford to have um, time off, um, so a lower socioeconomic area, people would come in and they would try to mask the fact that they had the flu because they needed to work, they needed to get the, the, the money coming through. And what was happening is they were coming in in close contact with all their colleagues, that was creating a dissemination of the flu and they were losing lots of productivity because all these people were getting sick when they didn't need to be sick um, because the people needed to work. So they said, can you look at detecting fever? Well, the answer is we can't detect fever um, unless you stop someone and you do an internal examination. And that's kind of a bit of an invasion. And um, that's kind of stops people getting into work. But what we can detect is one of the major symptoms of a fever. And that's a high temperature, a high skin temperature. So we um, used all our thermal information and we started developing this product called Thermi two years ago. There's a lot of devil in that detail. And this is where it comes back into something that you guys would understand and Pete might talk about it a little bit later. But for someone like me who you can see wearing glasses, for those of you who haven't seen a thermal image of someone wearing glasses, it looks almost demonic because you get this thermal reflection, which means that whatever's happening in your area, in, in a thermal image, it comes black but it means that that reading is not going to tell you what your skin temperature is. Someone like me that has a beard, right? Thermal goes through the beard. However, it still affects the temperature marginally. So if you're saying, if you've got technology that's capable of detecting a person and then technology that's capable of, of isolating that head, then you also need technology that's capable of isolating glasses, isolating beard, knowing that if you're taking the reading from the cheek, you're on average 0.7 degrees lower than a forehead reading. If you've got a hat on, you can't get that forehead reading. So being able to make that adjustment, that technology is very important. 
our legacy on Warney, which is AI and ML and people detection and PPE detection and all that other sort of really cool stuff, um, led us to be able to strip back things like beards, strip back things like glasses and get a true skin temperature. So what does, what does Thermi do as a ability to detect temperature, higher temperature in an organization? It identifies people within field of, views, uh, field of view, then it determines their head. It identifies the region, and I'll show you a little bit later, but it, defend, it identifies the region that that's coming from, and then it performs multiple analysis cycles of the skin temperature of that person. When I say multiple, 8.3 cycles per second it does on multiple people in field of view. It's, it's kind of cool. Uh, no other technology that we're aware of on the market does that, and no other technology on the market does that in a way that you are stopping it without stopping someone and saying, stand here, let me get your tear duct, let me get your forehead um, on a free flow environment so it doesn't stop people walking through. It determines people that are above the norm. So whether that's 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or whether that's um, 38 degrees Celsius, it will use that as a measure. What it also does is it understands that the conduit between a core body temperature and ambient temperature is the skin. So it's affected by both. So it understands that if you've come from a cold environment to a, uh, a warmer environment or vice versa, from a hot environment to a colder environment, that it needs to make a calculation based on the ambient temperature that you've come from to create a true skin temperature, which in line will give you a true core temperature. So we do that and it validates those temperatures against the, the, the real skin temperatures that we're getting. So it's like, for, again, those of you, and I believe most of you are that are technical, it's like a dual factor authentication um, on, on the skin temperature and the readings that we're giving. Thanks, Pete. So I've run through a lot of this, but it identifies the person, it identifies the face, multiple people, multiple Peterborough frame. We can do about 500 people a minute in real time. We define real time as 300 milliseconds or less. And it removes things like thermal flaring. So you might be standing beside a, um, a fridge, a freezer, a, um, a, a furnace, um, a fire, a hot glass window. It removes all that. It identifies the person, it identifies the head, and then it removes the things that might be sitting on the head that are going to give you false readings. It works on relative temperature between people in the environment and people that are entering the environment. Um, it, it allows us to understand what's happening with other things that might Im impact. So for example, if, if you're a reasonably fit person and you exercise and you come in and you've been running, it takes on average three seconds for a, a fit person for the skin to normalize. And it takes on average five seconds for an unfit person for the skin to normalize. However, if ambient temperature is high or low, those normalization factors can be somewhere between depending on how high or how low the delta is, between five and 25 minutes. So we need to take that into the equation and, and we do that. Um, and by using all those cycles, by I, able to isolate the things that create false, false detections and false readings, by understanding the environmentals and the other impact impacts on your skin temperature, like ambient temperature, we are able to create a, a product that in lab testing, and this is really important to understand, in lab testing is plus or minus 0.2 of a degree Celsius. In, in, um, with standard deviation uh, counted, it's 0.2988 of a degree. And the reason why I said it's really important to understand lab testing is every one of our competitors uses lab testing as their measure. Field testing, we are one of the only ones that get really, really close to that and sometimes exceed that depending on what the environment we're going into in field testing. No one that we're aware of um, outside getting water cooled thermal cameras gets anywhere near that. So, and they're a price point and a delta well beyond where we are. Thanks, Pete. So, give you a bit here and I've explained this. You look at a, a, a sample of a person we identify the person, we identify the head, then we identify the region that it's coming from. And effectively, we look at forehead, we look at neck or nap of the neck if they're, if they're turned around, we look at cheeks, and if we can see any of that, then we can detect. If we can see someone wearing a hijab or a burqa or um, any other form of, of robe or garment, we can also detect that and make variances to get fairly accurate. The accuracy does drop, but it's pretty close um, doing that sort of stuff. If someone's walking away, as long as their hair isn't thick, it's something like myself or Peter, 
we can pick up and get fairly accurate on that side of things. So um, that's that's kind of how we do it. I've explained through that slide pretty pretty much in detail. Pete? Um, yeah, it's probably worth mentioning there, Brett. Um, you know, where we're going with this is, is from product, we're going to take you into the technicals of what we do, but um, a really good important point here is, is how many models we use, we've developed and used to, to build Thermi. Um, and we currently run three different models. Um, they're all run concurrently, and then we run another two um, mathematical algorithms on top of that, ultimately to get to a core body temperature. So altogether, we basically pass data through about five different mathematical calculations. Um, and that's things like a custom built uh, object detector in Tensor RT for uh, person and head detection, through to then doing points three and four, the facial analysis back of the neck in a different model. Um, you know, there's a whole range of things we had to bring together to do this, um, to be able to convert thermal um, camera and FLIR sensor te um, uh, data into a temperature scale temperature model is another calculation. Um, and then ultimately through to a core body. So um, there's a huge number of steps we have to go through to get through to this result. And um, we'll, we'll take you through some of those learnings uh, in a sec. But the big one was, um, this is all based on a custom, um, we, we built our own layers in Tensor RT to be able to do object detection of persons and faces within a, a thermal image, um, simply because we couldn't get the accuracy um, using standard ones. But for those of interest, you can actually pick up the yellow V3 model uh, run that over a thermal image and it gives you about 80% accuracy on person detection uh, in a thermal image, just worth noting. Yeah, so I mean, some of the questions you might want to ask is what have we developed outside and, and what do we use as standard core products? Because um, there's a whole lot of stuff that you're going to see here that we talk about AWS is a big, a big and a good partner of ours and my word they are and they're so important to us, but a whole lot of stuff that we've developed and that's why we've gone global because we're doing stuff that um, sounds pretty easy, but no one else, no one else is doing um, in Australia or the rest of the world, which is really nice. So when COVID hit and COVID became serious really quick for all of us, and again for Pete sitting down in Victoria, still is very, very serious for us in in Queensland. Lucky enough to live in Queensland, uh, it's still serious, but um, we've got a lot more flexibility. So it had to be portable because they weren't allowing any of my team to go on site in a lot of areas. So we had to develop a, a portable model that someone could plug in. And have up and running and so we developed a model i'll show you a little bit of a picture about it later but we developed a model that effectively could be delivered and up and running within 20 minutes of arrival it had to be self-contained um, that means that it we had to give a version that needed no integration with anything else it had no other dependencies it would just get up and start reporting and and deliver what it needed to do it um, needed to be able to install in many areas and from our point of view and i haven't spoken about it yet but from our point of view, what we needed, what we always do is we design products that require little to zero operational overhead as we go forward, little to zero operational change as, as the product goes forward, and um, little to zero change in the way that behavior needs to happen. And the reason why that is, is implementing technology, that's really, really easy. Getting people to change the way that they act or move, that's really, really difficult. So let's not do that. Let's, um, let's let them go about what they do and, and we'll work with that. Um, we needed to make it assess one person or many people. We needed to make it non-contact, probably for COVID for many, many reasons that you, you would know. I don't need to talk through that, but we didn't want to put people in danger and we didn't want people taking off PPE like face masks without um, where they were meant to be used for safety to get a, a check on what they were doing. And it had to work both on the edge and in the cloud in harmony, because if you lost a connection, um, you didn't want to not be able to scan people. So we needed the scanning and the reporting to say someone was above temperature to happen on a, um, a local level. Thanks, Pete. So I'm, I'm not gonna harp on this one. That's a standalone version. That's um, Thermi. That's what uh, he looks like or she looks like, depending on uh, which sex you would like me to refer to it as, um, as a standalone version that can be up shipped up and installed and running and detecting people's temperature accurately to plus or minus 0.2 or plus or minus 0.3 depending on which level you want to go to within sub 30 minutes. Pete? Also, it can be deployed as a another device, device sitting on your network. So this one is sitting on a wall looking at an entrance area. 
goes down into the network and um, we can have five of these cameras sitting off one of our appliances and it continues to do the same thing. It will give you alerts to the dashboard, it will give you alerts to a mobile phone, it will give you alerts to email. Um, so, and it will also, it can set off an alert like um, stopping a turnstile, um, a light flashing to say that someone has come through with a high temperature, move them into whatever your standard medical procedures are. And what I wanna say is really key here, we're not a medical device. All we do is we show that there is a higher likelihood that someone has got a fever and we do that by looking at their skin temperature. We uh, don't claim to be a medical device. So how it works, um, if you look at this, um, you will see thermal images. So you'll see what I'm talking about with that demonic nature of people wearing glasses. You will see that we ignore everything in the background. We just detect the people coming through. What you will see is it doing calculations about where am I taking this from, the cheeks, the forehead, um, and it will start running those calculations. As I said, they're running at a, um, a huge rate per second. And we can take masses of 500 people a minute. You can see cars going through there with their discs at temperature, people walking past. They're not, they're not in the frame that we want to detect. We only want to detect people that have walked into the building. Um, and that's where a lot of the AI and ML comes into place. A lot of the other technologies will be detecting cups, coffee cups, they'll be detecting food that comes in, they'll be detecting people that's walking down the street, as you can see, it's not detecting those guys, they'll, it'll be detecting um, people with, um, with cars or brakes, that sort of stuff is temperature. And with a lot of our clients, both locally and internationally, we're seeing that 30 to 40% of the detections are false detections, whereas we're up well higher than that, well in the 90s of what we're doing. So that's how Thermi works. How does it report? So what do you actually see? As I said, the alert can go to your mobile phone, it can go to our email, but the dashboard is, is quite easy here. It sits here and it tells you how many people, um, how many samples have gone through on either a low temperature or a high temperature or a, a medium temperature. It tells you how many readings per person has come through. Over on the left-hand side, it tells you um, where the sites are, and this can be on a global basis. Um, and this can say, it's hierarchical. So it can report on, um, this is from the world, this is from uh, America, this is from Arkansas, this is from Springdale, this is um, Springdale site, whatever, right? So it's, it's all hierarchical and people can collect on, connect on that. Um, executives can look at it and see what's happening. Over here, it tells you the temperature and it shows you the picture. So the true use case of what happens and, and where it goes is probably best told by one of our clients, and this is Paolo. Mate. Oh, sorry, my bad. So this is gonna talk, that was Thermi, this is talking about Warney, guys. May last year, we had a tragic event on one of our Queensland traces. We understand the risk, we identify the risk, but I think in our organisation we get complacent with it. From that tragic circumstances of that event, we had to do something different. We had to look at technology. We had to look at a game changer. And that's where Warney came into play. A computer system, an artificial intelligence that's constantly looking in the environment the way a human can't. With the team of Big Mate, and I can't stress this enough, the team of Big Mate, Every single obstacle that we found, they found a solution. They found a solution immediately, and it was back to the drawing board, back into the field, testing it to see how accurate we could make the model. So we can look at a dynamic environment where cameras are gonna get bumped and cameras are gonna get moved, and that doesn't require someone to rectify that camera. We didn't want to create a huge capital expense for you. So having to upgrade all your cameras, having to move all your cameras. The last thing we wanted to do, was because a lot of your sites don't have uh, IT people in there, is we wanted it to be very simple. So from the time that you receive the, the warning appliance and you plug it into your VMS, it's up and running within half an hour and reporting accurately. So you're starting to get benefit from it right up front. And that model is effectively identifying a forklift and a pedestrian, stationary and moving, and the distance of those two objects between one another. And it will detect straight away those two objects when they come too close and it will alert us and it alerts us in many different ways it captures the image so i know something's happening on the site and i can look at that historically it also captures it immediately 
it sets off a text message to the manager so they can get up from the desk and get into the work area if they need to immediately if they're not already in the work area. But it also sets off a flashing light and alarm. And even though that's only in its immediate implementation phase, the long-term view is that alarm will become just like a fire alarm in any particular workplace. Anyone hears an alarm like that, they stop. They stop what they're doing because the threat to their life is imminent. I'll just let this first test run through. So guys, we'll, we'll cut that there. So the key to that is that that's not using special cameras. That's not using multiple cameras. That's using one camera. The key to this is that I'm not going to run through the figures, but you can see how much that costs economies and, and, and Australia, US, America is, is exactly the same. So we developed technology that allowed us to, to detect depth with a single camera, IP camera, in field of view, without a requirement for any sort of calibration, without a requirement for any sort of special camera and without a requirement for bifocal cameras. Pete? So the problem's fairly obvious. What we do as an organization outside of what we're talking about with Thermi is we create uh, dynamic exclusion zones, which means that if the camera moves, the exclusion zone's there, we have a rule set around it, which is a existing rule set that uh, organization will have around their oh &S. So if there's a, uh, in the left-hand side, if there's a front-end loader moving in the environment, you're not allowed to be there. So it will create an alert, unless you're sitting in the exclusion zone, which you can see is the green area down the bottom left. In the middle one, if you are in a certain proximity of a machine that has the capability of crushing about 10,000 people in one go, you shouldn't be in there. It will interact with the machine and it will stop it. On the far right, if you walk into a conveyor belt that goes up to the biggest industrial blender that you've ever seen, first of all, you're a little bit silly. Second of all, if you are really that silly that you go up to the stage where it's going to um, possibly throw you down the chute, then we will stop that equipment as well. And this is all based around computer vision and AI. It has absolutely nothing to do with nets uh, sitting through. It is simply one camera looking at how far away you are, what's in field of view, and we don't care if the camera gets bumped, we don't care if another camera gets added, it still runs to that rule set. So they are the business cases. That's what we do as an organization from Thermi with COVID-19 to Warney protecting life and limb. But I'll let Pete talk a little bit more about the architecture and, and um, how it all fits together from a technical point of view. So I'll, uh, I'll try and, um, and run through this in about seven minutes. Um, so hopefully let me know if I need to speed up or slow down, Michael. Um, just to give you a quick overview of the architecture, um, you know, we, we run edge appliances. Those edge appliances um, are used to, to access the video feeds. Uh, the reason we use edge appliances is we don't want to take video off site. We don't want to create a copy of the video um, to deal with both security and privacy issues. So they're always done on site with the physical premises. Um, data sent using Greengrass, um, MQTTS and, and images are pushed into S3 uh, because we can securely transmit and store them and then link them back in with the data at a later point. Um, so they're, they're really the main um, components in, in terms of the AIML. Um, we run a lot of EC2 clusters, um, application clusters, but we also do, uh, we don't just do uh, video analytics at the edge. We can post-process both images and video in the cloud if we have to. Um, so we can do data verification as a second stage in the cloud on those EC2s, um, which becomes really important when you're doing advanced use cases. Um, just jumping into to technical, everything we do is, is about CUDA and tensors. We love, we love really complex data arrays, um, so, so we love tensors. Um, and we're, we're tied to NVIDIA. Everything we do is coded typically straight in, into CUDA cores. Um, and we do that really to get the performance. So on a, an old RTX 2060 classic, we're probably getting between 150 and 200 frames per second. Um, that is typically around a thousand frames per second, drop down to 150 to 200, because we need to do all our processing within 300 milliseconds. So from receiving a frame from a video to outputting an event, we've got 300 milliseconds 
um, to do that. And, and that's really challenging. So um, we typically run at that, that latency, um, uh, event latency, we typically run around 150, 200 frames per second uh, on an RTX 2060. Um, there's lots that we do. Um, so object detection is obviously a key one. Um, we started with uh, lots of different models. Uh, we ended up settling on a, a YOLO um, or a derivative YOLO V3 model, and we're looking at moving to, to YOLO V4 and 5, but 4 or 5, but um, uh, because of, of all the work that we've done in training our models, uh, we're staying on V3 for now. Um, we built our own uh, pipeline in SageMaker, and so we use SageMaker and Ground Truth for, for image annotation. Uh, we then uh, trigger containers to do the actual training uh, in Darknet. One of the big challenges we've had there is, um, you know, it's really easy to build a model. It's really challenging to build and manage a model operationally in the, in the real world where you've got lots of different versions, you need to deal with lots of different issues around what you're detecting and missing, uh, and being able to streamline that and come up with one or two or three versions of models that you can then deploy across a large fleet of deployed systems. So scaling the operational environment is a huge challenge. Um, we made the mistake in the early days of, of thinking we'll do that later. Um, my advice to anyone is work out how you're going to manage your models and, and the training processes right up front um, because it's really time consuming and difficult to, to retrofit down, uh, down the path. Um, with our, our edge inference, um, you know, forwarding our frames through our, through our layers, we end up getting predominantly bounding box and, and class predictions. Um, they're the main things we do. Uh, we have to deal with cameras, which have lots of different resolutions, lots of different issues. Um, a Uniview camera and its RTSP stream produces very different results uh, to uh, an access camera. So, so you're dealing with lots of minute, minuscule issues that, that can really cause major problems. Um, and so we partner with Access, but we support almost any camera out there. Uh, but we do see a lot of different issues on those cameras and they're really embedded within, um, you know, how frames are created and transmitted and compliance with, with different protocols and, and the different levels of compliance that we see out there. Um, so that, that becomes a really time consuming issue. Um, so, um, you know, if in the ideal world, if you can settle on one camera ma manufacturer, um, <laughs> I, I definitely recommend doing it. Um, we also do a huge amount of tracking. Um, in the early days, we, we tried KCF and a few others and, and you know, we thought we'd get away with one tracking algorithm. Um, we ended up, um, you know, if I have a look at the, the, the different uh, tracking algorithms, we actually end up, ended up using five. So we use a quorum-based approach with five simultaneous trackers running that talk to each other and decide um, you know, around the, the, the IDs and things like that to work out whether it's a new object or, or it's lost tracking. And we had to do that because simply when you're tracking people in forklifts, um, you need to be really accurate. Um, so we do object detection between three and five frames per second and track in between. Um, and we use uh, that quorum approach to be able to get our accuracy in tracking up beyond, um, you know, beyond what, what's normally commercially available. Um, this is some of the early work that we did. And this is a really cool video we got um, somewhere in, in either Asia or, or, or India. Um, and we used it because it had lots of people and vehicles moving and lots of odd objects. Um, what the red and the yellow line shows you is um, historical trajectory versus um, predicted trajectory. And when you start mapping distance and looking at trajectories, you can identify things like when two people are gonna collide. Um, you know, usually it's a car and a person, but uh, this, this video gives you a really good example of um, how we track and analyze and try and calculate um, based on velocity and location, speed and distance apart, how we try and track and, 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 and uh, address collisions. Um, one of the really cool things, and this is on a, a typical YOLO V3 model, is you've got objects right up in the background around those, that red and uh, gray car there. Um, you know, we, we've, through tracking and, and object detection, we've got some really good tracking when people move behind vehicles. And we spent probably a good six months trying to work out how we, can, how we track accurately when we lose detection of the object um, through our object detector, because people do move behind objects and you still know they're there and you need to somehow 
um, from a, a CV application sense, work out um, where that person is relative to you know, a forklift or a truck that's moving in front of it, um, because you still want to do the safety analysis. So um, the, these become really important. The longer the yellow line, the faster someone's moving. Um, and it, it seems really visually really simple, but it becomes really complicated when you start trying to deal with all these uh, edge use cases, unlike traditional IoT and, and things like that, you'll get some edge cases. Um, it seems from the early days um, that, that in computer vision, everything's almost uh, an edge case. So um, being such a nascent industry, there's a lot of work that has to be done there. So I've, I've tried to run you through really a couple of key areas. One is, is um, the models and the frameworks that we use. Um, we settled on the Yellow V3, we train on Darknet, we convert that model to CAFE and we run it as a TensorRT model. Um, we do a lot of work with our object detection and, and we run lots of different models and we need to manage that and that's a real challenge. Um, tracking, we could never rely on a single tracking uh, algorithm so we use lots in Quorum. Um, and ultimately through combination of that with our distance and velocity, we're able to now take all that and do lots of really, really smart things to create the applications that Brett talked to you about. Um, so I'll kind of hand it back to you if there's anything I've missed there, Brett. No, I th no, Pete, I think you covered it really well. I think, and what we're seeing is we're seeing quite a lot of technical questions come in. So I think right now we'll open up the floor and I'll sit back and listen to you, Pete. Sure, I'll just stop this. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. That was interesting. Um, we will definitely open it up for questions. And I believe we've got a few here now. So going back from the start, uh, Joe Edwards asked, how do you address false positives, given that research has shown 70% of patients never develop any fever? Um, so really good question. Um, there, there's, it's actually probably around 50% don't have a fever that in the, in the latest research. Um, we don't detect that. So we will only detect where someone's got an elevated skin temperature and we can do a calculated core body temperature from that. If someone doesn't exhibit an elevated temperature, then we will not detect it. Um, for that reason, we focus on free flow. We don't focus on uh, gated or, or very uh, specific one-on-one -on -one analysis. We look for free flow analysis where we're looking for the needle in the haystack. Um, typically, that's on big sites where there's uh, between 500 and 1,000 staff coming and going on that site. They can't, for productivity and commercial reasons, stop each person for 30 seconds because business just can't keep running, particularly in, in the manufacturing environment. So this is about risk management and it's about trying to detect that needle in the haystack and it works really well. Um, but it's in that free flow where there really is no other solution. So other than stopping all those people and, and testing them one-on-one -on -one and still missing someone with, um, uh, that doesn't exhibit a fever, um, the free flow allows you to, to do it on, on mass scale um, and obviously the issues that go with that. And, and the scenario goes from the business point of view, if you can cut out 50% of the people that are at risk, you're 50% better off from those people that are at risk. It's as, it's as simple as that. Um, it's never going to be 100% accurate and nor, by the way, is invasive. So thermometers that um, either on, on the, the tongue or the under the arm or anywhere else that someone might stick the thermometer because people are asymptomatic sometimes. Awesome, thanks guys. Um, while we're on the topic of Thermi, uh, there was one that I was thinking about as well. Um, you mentioned adding your own layers to a TensorRT model. I assume that it's probably still a YOLO model uh, under the hood. Uh, was, was this a matter of using a computer vision model to detect a face and then finding the key feature areas and then processing that color separately? Um, or is it an end-to-end -end system? Um, and also, what is the, what's the processing speed of this system for, for Thermi? Yeah, look, great question. So um, they're, they're actually two separate models, one for people detection and one then for the facial analysis. Um, they both work in a similar way. We, we started off with YOLO V3, and we actually found we could detect between about 60 and 80% of people um, just using the standard off-the-shelf model, um, YOLO V3 model. Um, so that allowed us to test, but we couldn't, with any amount of training, we couldn't get that any higher. 
We then, as we, you know, the, I know there's a question around labelling and training data. What we found was the, as temperatures change throughout the day, um, you get different reflections and so the model would perform differently. So we actually created our own layer links and, and built that model from scratch at, at the, the yellow level. And then we took that and trained, and that was a, a dark net training process. Um, but it was trained with uh, lots of different thermal images in the vicinity of about 100,000 um, to get our model up to probably around about the 99, 99.5% uh, detection accuracy in all different temperature environments, so different um, colours. Um, the face model I don't know a lot about. Um, that one is under the hood and that one's quite complex because um, how that's done is the same principle but how it's been put together and how it's been deployed, I don't actually know. Um, that was a really complicated task. So we had um, two PhD guys do that, um, that, that worked for us. Um, and we're still yet to get around to understand, even, even our lead dev, I don't think knows how that one works. So I can't give much more on that. Um, there's, there's some real challenges in that model in being able to identify is at the front or the back of the head. Um, obviously, I can see you, Michael, I can tell you're looking at me. Uh, in a thermal image, you can't rely like you can in optical on um, eye features, nose features, mouth features. They just don't exist. Um, they're literally blobs. So how they've done that, I can't give you much on, I'm afraid. Um, performance on that um, is it runs at different FPS rates, uh, different, different throughput rates depending on the number of people, but typically up to 30 people concurrently in a frame, it will perform at 300 milliseconds. So it can analyze and provide results for 30 concurrent objects uh, within 300 milliseconds. Um, the issue there is getting that data through to the cloud platform does slow it down. So it can take up to about five to 10 seconds to get that volume of data through, but the, the edge inference and, and analysis all happens within about 300 milliseconds, up to 30 people. Over 30 people, it, it's not linear. It, there's a big jump in terms of, of time it takes. That sounds good. Um, awesome. So I guess moving on to a couple of questions from Yuna Wei. Um, the first one, as you mentioned, was about uh, labeled training data. So the question was, how do you collect and label your training data? And how, how do you build a feedback loop to continuously improve the prediction accuracy? Um, I love this question. Um, <laughs> It was a real challenge in the early days. So collecting and labelling data, um, there's two, two answers to that. The collection of data is really challenging. A lot of people want to protect their privacy. Um, we have to collect data. If we're doing it with a customer, we have to collect that data and it can only be used in models that are deployed for that customer. And there's lots of reasons for that. But the main one is not having, uh, having images used to train and, and, and do incremental training blend in with other images because you need those images to do things down track. So it, the, the issue is we can collect from our customers. It's the management of that has to be really segregated and really securely managed. That, that, that process is, is just that process and it's really challenging. Um, but yeah, we collect a lot of data from each customer. Um, we also collect a lot of public data. Um, so we'll collect public videos, we'll collect different scenes. It's amazing, um, you know, just from, you know, if you're doing cars, how much data you can collect from, from different roadways. Um, but the variety is critical. So, you know, we typically work on about two to 4,000 frames for annotation for each different scene that we're taking those images from. Um, and we can collect anything from 20,000 to 100,000 to process. That goes on to the labelling job. Um, labelling 20 to 100,000 images is, is a real problem. Um, we rely heavily on ground truth. Um, it's UI for labelling makes manual labelling really easily and we don't use public labelling. We only allow labelling workforces for our internal staff. So it puts more work on them and that's for privacy and security reasons. When we do that though, we rely heavily on the automated labelling functionality, annotation functionality within ground truth. Um, it needs in excess of, I think from memory, about 5,000 images manually annotated, and then it takes over. Um, but that can, that can basically handle all our, our remaining 80 odd thousand images. Um, and that process took about six months to set up and get right. 
Um, the time saving now is, is, you know, we're literally saving 90% of our time uh, in any labelling or, or incremental training jobs we've got to do. Uh, and it's about 95% automated. Um, we start it manually and we do some testing on it manually. Other than that, um, it's pretty much automated. Uh, in terms of the feedback loop, that's really hard. Um, there's two sources of feedback. One is, is end users, and we actually prioritise the end user first. If an end user doesn't like the result, um, that's what we use to drive. They know their environments better than anyone else, and we let that drive what we need to do to change our models um, for, for, um, uh, and, and, and drive up that, that, I guess, as you call it, prediction accuracy. Um, but we do also have automated feedback loops. So end users in the cloud dashboard can nominate a false image. That will get literally taken out of the dashboard, sent in as either a, a, a false positive or, or different classification. Um, and then that goes back into an automated training loop. Um, and what we'll do is we'll use that to then classify how we grab other similar images to be able to improve the model based on that. Really time consuming, oh. probably about to be honest, development's easy. It's probably, if development and training was 100% of our cost, training would be at least 50 to 60 in terms of resource and effort. Well, that's a good call out. And the, the automated labeling, I, I think it's, they've got it down to a couple thousand images now, I think before yeah. the, the model starts kicking in. But yeah, it's a, it's a challenge that uh, I've worked on quite a bit, trying to speed up that labeling process. It's, uh, it's often one of the costliest and time consuming of a, of a large scale computer vision project. So very interesting. Um, next question from you in a way is, is about validating performance. How do you validate the model performance before deployment in the production environment since, es since escape of any collision event is costly? Um, and yeah, I, to piggyback on this, I'm curious if the core metrics that you assess uh, precision and recall in a single image, or if you also have metrics that look at tracking through frames, you know, at a, a an event that might go across multiple frames. Mm. Um, so we, we've got a number we use, um, and I don't know the formal terminologies, but I know we use fairly standard statistical analysis on the, the model. Um, the process that we use is we have about a thousand test videos. So each model is taken and automated through those thousand test videos. Each one of those test videos tests object detection, tracking, and all our uh, depth. We've got to do the same for depth and same for uh, velocity calculations. Um, and then we've got event generation or you know, business logic in the application. So we run about a thousand videos through each, uh, automatically through each, get the results of that and use that to, to correlate whether it's an improvement whether there's an issue. And that's not simply statistical. It's also um, the business logic of, did we, de you know, little things like, did we detect or track that one frame behind or ahead of the previous test? Um, did that event get generated at exactly the same time, uh, time interval or was there a variance? So there's lots of permutations that come out of it. Um, that has, that's fully automated. Um, and what we end up with is we end up with a massive database. We use RapidMiner, if anyone knows it. Um, we, do, we use RapidMiner a lot to, to process those results. Um, we do some cloud stuff, but we just, we find most of the time you want to have a look at the data and, you know, from different, different perspectives. And um, that's proven really useful to look at the, the, the statistical outputs from all our models. Um, and it lets us run simulations. So we can actually take 10 different um, uh, model um, audit results, channel them all into RapidMiner and start comparing them and, and move between whether we're comparing what, what's come out at the, the business logic end or the, the depth end to be able to see what's moved. Um, very much, you know, it, you know, it is the butterfly effect um, and that has been a big challenge. So, you know, if we tweak the model or, you know, something as simple as changing the confidence level, um, you know, the, the butterfly effect gives us completely different outputs at the other end because we've detected an object, you know, a millisecond earlier, uh, all these flow on effects happen. So the, the, the only way we can do that is, is statistical analysis through a really complicated but automated process. Um, I don't know the specifics of um, uh, what we look for in terms of once we've processed a model, what stats we get out of it. Um, but they're fairly, they're, they're probably 90% of, of what you would um, typically read about online. We're not doing anything unique in that sense. 
Sounds good. Um, and there's, I've, I can't see any other questions. So if anyone has any other questions down here, uh, please share them. Uh, there is one more that I had in mind. Um, you mentioned about some of the challenges of building and deploying models um, and how building a model is often the easy part, but maintaining the models and having that continuous integration pipeline is really challenging. Um, I know from experience that that whole process and that list of lessons can be very long, but I'm curious if you can tell us some of the, the biggest pitfalls um, that, that you know really cost you guys time and what some of the strategies are that you use to deal with that, maybe some of the tools or, or frameworks. Um, so probably the biggest problem was um, not, not picking the right picking the right model. We, we, we've never changed off yellow V3. That was the first one you know, when we did our analysis, and we we're really happy with that. But the framework that we uh, convert it to and run it under, um, we have changed a lot. So we used to run it under, you know, do things in darknet. Then we moved to, what did we move to after that? TensorFlow, CAFE. So we've ch constantly changed our frameworks and, and you know, we, we changed our application. So it was running under one framework on the box. And then we changed that to a different framework. And then we ultimately got to this TensorRT um, just because of the NVIDIA links. And so we've done a lot of converting of our data, which isn't hard, but it's really finicky. Um, so all our models and, you know, all these data conversions have proven really challenging. Um, you know, if we could redo it again, we'd say settle on, um, you know, settle on one framework, settle on, um, you know, one model style and don't change. Um, the biggest challenge though has been at the application level. Um, things like FFmpeg versus GStreamer. Um, you know, you get 90% down the path with GStreamer, then you've got to swap it out to, to the FFmpeg SDK because the one thing you wanted to do is, is broken in GStreamer um, and it works in FFmpeg and then you find something else is broken in FFmpeg. You know, so you're trying to constantly ba balance the issues. Um, you know, that's probably the bigger challenge than the model um, we settled on yellow v3 we we've got that process down pat I think the biggest thing is get your process right up front and and get your management of models in terms of how you're going to manage your version control incrementally try and work that out before you start because after the fact you got 86 files and you don't know which is which um, so so really it's the boring stuff it's it's naming conventions version control process management those things are more important and at the application level um, be prepared that you're going to have lots of problems um, you know we just we, we we wanted to move to python 3.8 on one application um, the nvidia sdk that we were using um, with the python wrappers around the csdk uh, was only 3.7 i think um, so then we had incompatibilities with our green grass lambda so those compatibility issues you know, of what takes time. Um, probably the last thing which I, I absolutely have to mention is version is um, dependency management. So your core application is easy. It's when you want to go and build a box, uh, the interdependencies of all the all the dependent applications you need to make operationalize and commercialize that box is an absolute dog's breakfast um, for no other reason than everyone's doing lots of great things, but trying to turn it into a commercial product. Um, you know, the, the number of gotchas and incompatibilities and how you're going to manage updates is just a phenomenal headache. Um, so definitely don't, don't leave the operationalization till the last minute because um, we found it, it's taken a huge amount of time and there's often no easy quick fix for it. Sounds great. And out of curiosity for serving these models, you're obviously using SageMaker for training and the, I guess the labeling through the training pipeline. Are you deploying these models as SageMaker endpoints or are you deploying them Kubernetes or? Yeah, uh, Kubernetes a little bit. Um, most of ours go onto edge, edge boxes. So this, um, yeah. most of ours go onto, um, you know, this sort of TX2 type custom build um, matches the background. That's nice. <laughs> um, so we do auto deployments. We, we version everything in S3 and then we run systems manager to do auto deployments. Um, so we can roll out the 500 boxes tonight and um, just with, you know, a simple um, deployment maintenance window. Um, we love S3 because it's secure and allows us to version control and then push stuff out and, and roll back if we have to. Um, 
so yeah, most of our stuff is on the edge. I'd say 90%. The only stuff um, that we do in the cloud is for the, the higher end uh, clients like government that can afford to run, um, you know, media live streaming with, with um, you know, a nice Kinesis analytics stream and then, uh, you know, 10 EC2s in a cluster doing real time processing on a high def 25 FPS feed. Um, but the cost of doing that is in the probably to run a single feed on a high def broadcast quality thing probably costs around 500 bucks a week, 600 bucks a week just for the EC2s. Um, so it starts to add up really quickly. Interesting. Very interesting. All right. I think that is all of our questions. Um, so I think we'll wrap up. Um, Brett, Peter, I just want to say thank you for your time and, and presenting. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Um, yeah, there, there will be a recording. Uh, after this and if you have any questions feel free to get in contact with Peter and Brett I know that Peter is locked up at the moment and can't leave the house so I'm sure <laughs> any contact would be appreciated um, other than that thank you everyone for attending I will look to have our next event up fairly soon and uh, yeah thanks again thanks all and Michael if, if there's any technical questions that I, I can pass on to the team to get answered um, please let me know I'm happy to get the uh, technical ones answered by the experts. <laughs> Sounds good. Awesome. Um, thanks again, guys. Have a great night. Thanks, Brett and Peter. Take care, guys. See ya. Ciao.